my channel uh i figured a good supplementary content to the upcoming uh talk with steven <laughs> or destin is a, a good old speed read through the infamous kill the indian save the man uh let's i'm gonna just check make sure yeah that looks like like the audio is working all right let's go let's go <clears throat> i haven't warmed my voice up today so we'll see how it goes all right <clears throat> Beginning in 1887, the federal government attempted to Americanize Native Americans largely through the education of Native youth. By 1900, thousands of Native Americans were studying at almost 150 boarding schools around the United States. The U.S. Training and Industrial School, founded in 1879 at Carlisle, Bear, Pennsylvania, was the model for most of these schools. Uh, boarding schools at Carlisle provided vocational and manual training and sought to systematically strip away tribal culture. They insisted that the students drop their Indian names, forbid their speaking of native languages, and cut off their long hair. Not surprisingly, such schools often met fierce resistance from Native Americans, parents, and youth. But the schools also fostered a sense of shared Indian identity that transcended tribal boundaries. The following excerpt from a paper read by Carlisle founder Captain Richard H. Christ Pratt at an 1892 convention spotlights Pratt's pragmatic and frequently brutal methods. Pragmatic and frequently brutal. <laughs> Dude, only for the Indians, bro. Only only for the natives is pragmatism is brutal. Uh, for civilizing the savages, including his analogies to the education and civilizing of African Americans. And from the All of My Relations podcast, quick plug to them, they talked about how it was the duality of blood quantum and one drop. One drop meant to spread the seed of slavery across the African population and blood quantum to thin the blood of the natives until they were <laughs> white or, or you know, whoever had the best chance at raping them. Uh, a great general has said that the only good Indian is a dead one and that high sanction of his destruction has been an enormous factor in promoting Indian massacres. In a sense, I agree with this sentiment, but only in this, that all the Indian there is in the race should, should be dead. Kill the Indian in him and save the man. We are just now making a great pretense of anxiety to civilize the Indians. I use the words pretense purposely, aiming it to have all the significance it could possibly carry. Washington believed that commerce freely entered into between us and the Indians would bring about their civilization, and Washington was right. He was followed by Jefferson, who inaugurated the reservation plan. Jefferson's reservation was to be the country west of the Mississippi. The country west of the Mississippi. And he issued instructions to those controlling Indian matters to get the Indians there, and let the Great River be the line between them and the whites. Any method of securing removal, persuasion, purchase, or force was authorized. Jefferson's plan became the permanent policy. The removals have generally been accomplished by purchase, and the evils of this are greater than those of all others combined. It is a sad day for the Indians when they fall under the assault of our troops, as in the Pike and Massacre, and the Massacre of Old Black Kettle and his Cheyennes in what is termed Little Washita, blah, 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 deal with it. But for Saturdays, when they fall under the baneful influences of a treaty agreement with the United States, whereby they are to receive large annuities and to be protected on reservations and held apart from all association with the best of our civilization. The destruction is not so speedy, but it is far more general. The history of the Miamis and Osages is only the true picture of all other tribes. Put yourself in his place is as good as God to to a proper conception of the Indian and his causes to help us to the right conclusions on our relations with other men. For many years, we greatly opposed, opposed the back the. the black men but the germ of human liberty remained among us and, gr and grew until in spite of our irregularities there came from the lowest savagery into intelligent manhood and freedom among us more than seven million of our population who are today an element of industrial value with which we could not well dispense However great this victory has been for us, we have not yet fully learned our lesson nor completed our work, nor will we have done so until there is throughout all of our communities the most unequivocal and complete acceptance of our own doctrines, both national and religious. <laughs> Sounds... Wait, where was this written? Oh, uh, in the 1800s? Oh, get over it, forehead. It was like, it's in the 1800s, dude. Uh, wait, uh, not until there shall be in loyal... 
Uh, whatever. Some some crap about Constitution God. Inscrutable are the ways of providence. Horrible are the experiences of its introduction. Of slavery itself, which was concealed in them, the great blessing that ever came to the race. Uh, seven millions of people from cannibalism in uh, darkest Africa to citizenship in free and enlightened America. Not full, not complete citizenship, but possible, probable citizenship. And on the highway near to it. There's a great lesson in this. The schools did not make them citizens. <laughs> The schools did not teach them the language, nor make them industrious and self-supporting. Denied the right of schools, they became English-speaking and industrious through the influences of association. Scattered here or in there, under the care and authority of individuals of the higher race, they learned self-support and something of citizenship, and so reached their present place. No other influence or force would have been so speedily accomplished such a result. Left in Africa, surrounded by their fellow people, our seven millions of industrious black sla fellow civilians would still be people transferred into these new surroundings or experiences behold the result they became english speaking and civilized became forced into association with english speaking and civilized people became healthy and multiplied because they were property and industrious because industry which brings contentment and health was a necessary quality to increase their value nothing like some good turn of the century capitalism dude shouts out adolescent by dostoevsky uh, we have never made any attempt to civilize them with the idea of taking them into the nation. And all our policies have been getting synthesized. Uh, <laughs> am I actually going to finish reading this? Is anyone still even watching this? Oh, okay. Put it on two times speed. The Indians under our care remained savage because forced back upon themselves and away from association with English-speaking civilized people and because of our savage example and treatment of them. We have never made any attempt to civilize with the idea of making them to the, into the nation. All our policies have been against citizen, citizenizing, citizenizing and absorbing them. Although some of the policies now prominent are advertised to carry them to citizenship and consequent association and competition with the other masses of the nation, they are not in reality calculated to do this. Who does that remind me of? But <laughs> we are we are after the facts. Let us take the land and severality bill. The land and severality as min administered is in the way of individualizing and civilizing the native Indians, the individualizing and civilization of the Indians. Okay, a means of holding the tribes together. Land and severality is given the individuals adjoining each other on their present reservations. And experience shows that in some cases, after the allotments have been made, the Indians have entered into a compact among themselves to continue to hold their lands in common as a reservation. The inducement of the bill is in this direction. Why is she rhyming so much? The Indians are not only invited to remain separate tribes and communities, but are practically compelled to remain so. The Indian must either cling to his tribe and its locality, or take great chance of losing his rights and property. Ding, 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 ding. Uh, relevant to the conversation. Uh, uh, the day on which the Land and Severality Bill was signed was announced to be the Emancipation Day for the Indians. The fallacy of that idea is so entirely demonstrated that the Emancipation Assumption is now withdrawn. We shall have to go elsewhere and seek for other means besides Land and Severality to release these people from their tribal relations and to bring them individually into the capacity and freedom of citizens. Just now that land severality is being retired as one of the all-powerful leverage that is going to emancipate and bring about Indian civilization and citizenship, we have another plan thrust upon us which has received great impotent encomium from its authors and has secured the favor of Congress to the extent of vastly increasing appropriations. The plan is calculated to arrest public attention and to temporarily gain a concurrence from everybody. That is really the panacea for securing citizenship and equality in the nation for the Indians. In its ex execution, this means purely tribal schools among the Indians. That is, Indian youth must continue to grow up under the pressure of home surroundings. Individuals are not to be encouraged to get out and see and learn and join the nation. They are not to measure their strength with their other inhabitants of the land and find out what they do not know, and thus be held to aspire to gain an education, experience, and skill, those things that they must know in order to become equal to the rest of us. A public school system, especially for the Indians, is a tribal system, and this very fact says to them that we believe them to be incompetent, that they must not accept to cope with us, attempt to cope with us. 
Such schools build up tribal pride, tribal purposes, and tribal demands of the government. They formulate the notion that the government owes them a living and vast sums of money, and by improving their education on these lines, but giving no other experience and leading to no aspirations beyond the tribe, leaves them in their chronic condition of helplessness, so far as reaching the ability to compete with the right with the white craze is concerned. It is like attempting to make a man well by telling him he is sick. We have only to look at the tribes who have been subject to this influence to establish this fact, and it makes no difference where they are located. All the tribes in the state of New York have been trained in tribal schools, and there are still tribes in the Indians with no desire among the masses to be anything else but separate tribes. The five civilized tribes of the Indian Territory. Five civilized ones. In other words, white people claim to be them all the time. The five civilized tribes of the Indian Territory. Cherokees, Choctaws, Chickasaws, Creeks, and Seminoles have had tribal schools until it is asserted that they are civilized, yet they have no notion of joining us and becoming a part of the United States. Their whole disposition is to prey upon and hatch up claims against the government and have the same lands purchased and repurchased and purchased again to meet the recurring wants and growing out of the neglect and inability to make use of their large and rich estate. Indian schools are just as well calculated to keep the Indians intact as Indians as Catholic schools are to keep the Catholics intact. Under our principles, we have established a public school system where people of all races may become unified in every way and loyal to the government. Uh, wait. TOS, TOS. We do not gather the people of one nation to schools by themselves and the people of another nation into schools by themselves, but we invite the youth of all peoples into all schools. We shall not succeed in Americanizing the Indian unless we take him in exactly the same way. I do not care if abundant schools on the plan of Carlisle are established. It's the principle we have always had at Carlisle of sending them out into families and to the public schools were left out, the result would be the same, even though such schools were established, as Carlisle is, in the center of an intelligent and industrious population. And those such schools were, as Carlisle always has been, filled with students from many tribes. Purely Indian schools say to the Indians, You are Indians and must remain Indians. You are not of the nation and cannot become of the nation. We do not want you to become of the nation. But I leave this part of my subject. I feel com impelled to lay before you the facts as I have come to look at them. And another influence that has claimed credit and has always been and is now very dictatorial in Indian manners. And that is the missionary as a citizenizing influence upon the Indians. The missionary goes to the Indian. He learns the language, associates with him, makes the Indian feel he is friendly and has great desire to help him. He even teaches the Indian English. But the fruits of his labor, by all the examples I know, have been to strengthen and encourage him to separate and apart from the rest of us. Of course, the more advanced, those who have a desire to become civilized and to live like white men, who would, with little encouragement, go out into the communities, are the first to join the missionaries' forces. They become his, his lieutenants to gather in others. The missionary must necessarily hold on to every help he can get to push forward his schemes and plans so that he may make a good report to his church. And in order to enlarge his work and make it a success, he must keep his community together. Consequently, anyone who cares to get out into the nation and learn from actual experience what it is to be civilized, what is the full length and breadth and height and depth of our civilization, we must stay and help the missionary. The operation of this has been disastrous to any individual escape from the tribe, has vastly and unnecessarily prolonged the solution of the question, and has needlessly cost the charitable people of this country large sums of money, to say nothing of the added cost to the government, the delay in accomplishing the civilization and the destruction caused by such delay. If, as sometimes happens, the missionary kindly consents to let or helps one go out and get these experiences, it is only for the purpose of making him a preacher or a teacher or help of some kind. And such a one must, as soon as he is fitted, and much sooner in most cases, return to the tribe and help the missionary to save his people. The Indian who goes out has public charitable aid through his school course, forfeits his liberty, and owned by the missionary. 
In all my experience of 25 years, I've known scarcely a single missionary to heartily aid or advocate the disintegration of the tribes and the growing of individual Indian rights and opportunities among civilized people. There is this in addition, that the missionaries have already largely sunk to dictate to the government as policy with tribes and their dictations have always been along the lines of the colonies and church interests, and the government must gauge its actions to suit the purposes of the missionary, or else the missionary influences are at once exerted to defeat the purposes of the government. The government, by paying large sums of money to churches to carry on schools among Indians, only builds for itself opposition to its own interests. We make our greatest mistake in feeding our civilization to the Indians instead of feeding the Indians to our civilization. America has different customs and civilizations from Germany. What would be the result of an attempt to plant American customs and civilizations among Germans in Germany, demanding that they become thoroughly American before we admit them to this country? Now what we have along, all along attempted to do for and with the Indians is just exactly that, and nothing else. We invite the Germans to come into our country and communities and share our customs, our civilization, to bear of it. And the result is immediate success. Why try not to the Indians? Well, I can't do it. Why not invite them into experiences in our communities? Why was I invite them compel them to remain a people unto themselves? It is a great mistake to think that the Indian is born an inevitable savage. He, was, he is born blank, like all the rest of us. Left in the surroundings of savagery, he grows to possess a, serv a savage language, superstition, and life. We, left in the surroundings of civilization, grow to possess a civilized language, life, and purpose. Transfer the infant white to the savage surroundings. He will grow to possess a savage language, superstition, and habit. Transfer the savage-born infant to the surroundings of civilization, and he will grow to possess a civilized language and habit. These results have been established over and over again beyond all question, and it is also well established that those advanced in life, even to maturity, of either class, lose already acquired qualities belonging to the side of their birth, and gradually take on those of the side to which they have been transferred. As we have taken over to our national family, every millions of, as we have received foreigners at the rate of more than 500,000 a year and assimilate them, it would seem that the time may have arrived when we carry properly make at least to the attempt to assimilate our 250,000 Indians using this proven potent line and see if it will not end this vexed question and remove them from public attention where they occupy so much more space than they are entitled to either by numbers or worth. The school of Carlisle is an attempt on the part of the government to do this. Carlisle has always planted treason to the tribe and loyalty to the nation at large. It has preached against colonizing Indians and in favor of individualizing them. It has demanded for them to be the same multiplicity of chances which all others in this country enjoy. Carlisle fills young Indians with the spirit of loyalty to the stars and stripes and then moves them out into our communities to show by their conduct and ability that the Indian is no different from the white or the colored, that he has the inalienable rights to liberty and opportunity that the white and the people have. Carlyle does not dictate to him what line of life he should fill, so it is an honest one. It says to him that if he gets his living by the sweat of his brow and demonstrates to the nation that he is a man, he does more good for his race than hundreds of his fellows who cling to their tribal communistic surroundings. No evidence is wanted to show that in our industries, the Indian can become a capable and willing factor if he has a chance. What we need is an administration who will give him the chance. The land and survival bill can be made far more useful than it is, but it can be made so only by assigning the land so as to intersperse good civilized people among them. If in the distribution, it is so arranged that two or three white families have come between two Indian families, then there would be necessarily grow up a community of fellowship along all the lines of our American civilization that would help the Indian at once to his feet. Indian schools must, of necessity, be for a time because the Indian cannot speak the language and he knows nothing of the habits and forces he has to contend with. But the highest purpose of all Indian schools ought to be only to prepare the young Indian to enter public and other schools of the country. 
Yeah. <laughs> Where the fuck did it go? And immediately he is so prepared for his own good and the good of the country, he should be forwarded into these other schools, there to temper, test, and stimulate his brain and muscle into the capacity he needs to struggle for life in competition with us. The missionary can, if he will, do stimulate his brain and muscle and the capacity he needs for his struggle. Oh, wait, fuck. Wait, fuck. The missionary can, if he will, do far greater service in helping the Indians than he has done. But it will only be by practicing the doctrine he preaches. After his work is to lift into higher life the people whom he served, he must not, under any pretense whatsoever, give the lie to what he preaches by by discountenancing the right of any individual Indian to go into higher and better surroundings. But on the contrary, he should help the Indians to do that. If he fails in thus helping, encouraging the Indian, he is false to his own teaching. If he fails in thus helping and encouraging the Indian, he is false in his own teaching. Damn, this is some crayon shit. She's like, don't you know by helping them, they're now less prepared to protect themselves. <laughs> An examination shows that no Indians within the limits of the United States have acquired any sort of capacity to meet and cope with the whites in civilized pursuits who did not gain the ability by doing among the whites and out from the reservations, and that many have gained this ability by, go, by so going out. Theorizing citizenship in the people is a slow operation. What a farce it would be to attempt teaching American citizenship to the, uh, to the people in Africa. They could not understand it. And if they did, in the midst of such contrary influences, they could never use it. Neither can the Indians understand or use American citizenship theoretically taught to them on Indian reservations. They must get into the swim of American citizenship. They must feel the touch of it day after day. Until they become saturated with the spirit of it, and thus become equal to it. When we cease to teach the Indian that he is less than a man, when we recognize fully that he is capable in all respects as we are, and that he only needs the opportunities and privileges which we possess to enable him to insert his humanity and manhood. When we act consistently towards him in accordance with that recognition, when we cease to fetter him with conditions which keep him in bondage, surrounded with retrogressive influences, when we allow him the freedom of association and the developing influences of social contract, then the Indian will quickly demonstrate that he can truly be civilized, and he himself will solve the question of what to do with the Indian. Kill yourself. <laughs> That's what you just said. Oh, okay, dude, don't, don't, don't kill yourself, anybody. But literally, he just said, "Kill yourself." <laughs> okay. All right. Bye.